ask that you fill out the yellow form. You saw these when you came in. Um, please read the instructions and indicate the agenda item, if any, that you wish to address, and we will introduce you at the appropriate time. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Frank Alfaro for recognitions and delegations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson. I am excited to kick off our first recognition tonight by asking our Liberty Elementary teacher, Susanna Sealy, to come on down. Yay! There, I have a little gift for you, so let's not forget to give you uh, that before you run off. Um, and periodically, we create videos to highlight certain staff members who exemplify, exemplify our profile of the learner. Now, our profile of the learner is uh, uh, our list of skills, attributes, and habits of mind that we strive to instill in all of our students uh, by the time they graduate from Alamo High School. Uh, it's our student facing vision, if you will. And, but part of the things that we have to do as adults is we have to exemplify that profile ourselves. And so we help, we like to spotlight certain uh, uh, of our employees that exemplify that. And to do that, we have a short video of uh, Ms. Sibley. Let's watch. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susanna Sitterly, and I am the profile by engaging socially and globally. working with others help us engage socially and globally and what does it mean when we say we rise by lifting others in this classroom we engage socially and globally um, as the way that we uphold our easily creed and um, embody the online profile of learner so in order to engage socially and globally my students start off with a mutual respect for others and our treatment agreement. Our treatment agreement is something that we co-created at the beginning of the year that values diversity as a strength by allowing every student to contribute what they bring to this classroom and what they need from this classroom in order to learn and grow while feeling safe. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. Your legacy is the way that you make other people feel. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing. Every student that comes into this classroom brings a unique fund of knowledge. As a teacher, my job is to know those students so deeply so that they feel empowered to let that diversity shine in our classroom. Come on, All right, love the energy. She's my background singer that I have my I need some lifting up. I got it. So you're using your expertise Pokemon to make a creative connection. Nice, Mary. The way our students understand their relationship and responsibility to society is embedded in our Woodridge core values, um, acts of service to our community, but also in just saying yes to kids. My students are naturally curious. He's just really trying to make sure everybody understands and takes risks. Some of these students I've had as second graders. She wants to help everybody make a mark on the world, um, whether it's by themselves or with help, and I think that's really cool. They have a beautiful will to see the community around them. We all have a set of rules, not just the teacher. We make sure that everybody feels welcome and so that we can engage with others. I really just say yes to their ideas, because students naturally want to make this world a better place and feel that responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> and it is okay that you love to do that. We still think you're normal. <laughs> Let's give her a round of applause. And so as you notice, uh, the different banners that scroll through that video are all parts of our profile of the learner. Uh, there are six different domains, and I see Jerry over there. Uh, Jerry, good to see you. That's the principal of Woodridge. Shout out to Woodridge, be the we, and all the character uh, stuff that you guys do, and that 
Susanna is in the Viking classroom as well. Thanks. So uh, I would like to ask you if you have anything to say. This is the time to do it. Oh, sure. I just want to say thank you all so much. This is actually my last year here in Alm Heights and at Woodridge, and I went to school at Cambridge, Woodridge Junior School, High School, and my experience being a teacher here and staff member has been formative, and I've grown so much, but really it's just been the greatest honor to serve the community that gave so much to me. So thank you all. She's moving away. She told she's got a job as an instructional coach up in the Austin area, so yeah. we're we're mad that you're taking her away, whoever's taking you, but uh, we're happy for you. Thank you so much. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I pull up our next uh, honorees, I'd like to explain uh, the award they're getting. It's called the Spotlight on Excellence. Periodically, we shine the spotlight on employees that work often behind the scenes to help contribute to our tradition of excellence. And um, this one's actually a, few, a pretty interesting one because you'll probably, if, at the, if you're at campus, you will recognize these folks, but you will not understand what they do until I kind of explain that. And so we like to shine our spotlight on excellence on our Alamo Heights ISD campus day clerks and our district uh, person of a lot of many hats, <laughs> Trisha Corey, come on down. All you guys, come on up and right here. Yeah, I've seen that person at the campus, and and uh, um, and so you know, I thought that person answered phones and did receptionist stuff. Well, these folks here, uh, let, let's have, actually have you introduce yourselves, and we'll go down. And tell us who you are and where you work, and you can even tell us kind of what your title is that you remember. <laughs> My name is Trisha Corey. I work for the district in the technology department, and I am the technology um, student and management information systems analyst. Yeah, no <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ashley Stewart. I'm at Woodridge Elementary and I am the data clerk slash attendance slash registrar. <laughs> Hi, my name is Flo Rodriguez and I am at the junior school and I am the data processor and secretary to the academic team. I am Michelle Baird. I uh, work at the high school and I'm the registrar and data processor. shining the spotlight behind the scenes that nobody really understands or really wants to know is that uh, we get our funding from the state of Texas based on a bunch of data that we have to submit to them regularly. And that data has to do with students' enrollment, where they live, a whole bunch of information about students. It has to do with attendance. And if that's not accurate, we don't get funded the right way and we get a lot of trouble. And so the attention to detail uh, is mind-boggling. And, and I'm sure it drives you nuts sometimes, because you're trying to work, and then people are calling you or asking you, hey, can you deliver this lunch? Hey, can you call somebody? You're like, yeah, I'm trying to get this detail right so that my payer doesn't call me to say, there's a mistake. <laughs> and so uh, uh, the, the notion of that's just teams, that's a really important job. And these uh, folks are, have an attention to detail and uh, customer service as well, to do both at the same time is mind-boggling to me. Now, and that's at the campus level. Now, Trisha especially has an interesting role because she interfaces with all of these folks at the campus, but plus, she's kind of like that, that liaison between what TEA gets and all the stuff that they turn in. And this year, she's just taken a whole other step, uh, almost a 180 into deeper into that pink world to help us um, as, uh, well, just to help, uh, I was going to say as Mike gets older, but that would have been fun. That would have been, <laughs> so I didn't say that. Uh, but and so we really appreciate Trisha especially, but all of you guys, man, talk about behind the scenes. 
Uh, I know Jamie couldn't be here tonight. Jamie Laughlin, our director of technology, he's at a conference, but he uh, sings y'all's praises uh, exponentially. And so I know that we all do as well. And so that's why we're shining the spotlight on you today. Congratulations. outside. Is there a big summer submission still? Yeah. Is that a sort of subject? It's dirty wood. Sort of subject. Too soon for it. Um, all right. Our next recognition, I'd like to have these uh, three men come up, and we'd like to recognize state tennis team Bronze state medal winners, uh, come on down. We'll, we'll meet you in front of you. Excuse me, we're not the oldest, but we'll do you first, the oldest student first. Tell us who you are, uh, what grade you are, and then you pass the mic and we'll end with your coach. My name is Robert Punts, and I just graduated high school. My name is Paul Patel, and I'm going to be a senior next year. And I'm Larry Oster, the tennis coach. Tell us about this team, Larry. Well, they're kind of an accidental doubles team. Let me get down here where you can see more uh, their height. <laughs> Robert was playing doubles with a the number three guy on our team. Ballin was playing doubles with the number four. Robert's partner, dodging the ball in the fall, fell, hit the court, got a concussion, and went on protocol. And so I had to mix up the doubles team, and uh, Ballin played the ad court. It's got a great two-hand backhand. Robert played the deuce court, and they just started beating everybody. They barely lost to the team from uh, AM Consolidated, the state team tennis semifinals that went off and went state. They lost 6-7-6, uh, six, seven, six, six, seven, seven, six, Super Tiger. And then they beat the Highland Park team. So in the spring, Ballin was playing number one singles, couldn't quite decide whether he's going to play doubles or singles. First tournament of the spring, invitational season. They won easily without losing a set, but Ballin hurt his left wrist. So that kind of ended that question. Ballin was not going to play singles. So there they are, my accidental team. They went on to win district without losing a set, win one, one regionals without losing a set, and made it to the state semifinals. You all, uh, to your parents for all their support, to uh, Coach Oxford uh, for the great narration, but also for all your support, Larry. And then we want to uh, also say, uh, Robert, you're going off to Rice in the fall. Correct. So congratulations <laughs> to you. And Alan, you're still here with us for another year. So we're looking forward to another great year for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, that concludes our recognitions for the evening. We're about to turn into the business portion. So if you're here just for the recognitions like these guys are going to go play tennis, you guys can head off right now if you'd like. But if you're here for the business portion of the meeting statement, so we'll give you guys a moment also to leave. Congratulations and take plenty of pictures outside. Thanks, uh, Susanna. Yeah.
we can't answer any questions, we can't respond at all. We just sit here and listen. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not interested. We are very grateful for you all taking your time to come speak to us tonight, but by state law, we just have to listen. It's limited to three minutes per person. Alicia will hold up a card when there's one minute left. Then she'll hold up another card when time is up. We ask that you stop when the three minutes are up as a courtesy to everyone else. We have several speakers tonight, but as a courtesy, we have to keep you all to three minutes. And I hate to be rude, but if I have to, we'll cut you off if we have to. So please stop at three minutes. Um, we ask that in making your presentation, don't name individual, either students or uh, district employees. Try and take all of your remarks general as opposed to identifying individuals. With that, uh, Cliff Whittingshall, you will be first, and then the next up will be Sean Caparelletti. Whenever you're I don't on. think it's on. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's It'll be a lot better once in a time. Okay. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I, I, part of my profession is I go to a lot of board meetings. I'm a K-12 architect, so I understand what you do, and thank you for your service. I'm here today as a parent of a white ball player, but I want to talk about basketball and girls white ball. We're not understanding why both were moved to second period when they were in the last period for many years. There's a couple of reasons why. One, as you can imagine, you can suit out, you can practice, you continue your practice after school. You're not worried about getting to a class, you're not worried about getting to other lunches. How do you shower? The second and more important reason is they're going to miss 25% of their class time with this in the last period. Last period used to be volleyball or basketball, so they would miss that. The travel to Dripping Springs, Bernie, and Curb, but we have a far district, right? And so how are they going to make up that time? That's a huge part of the chunk of, of their class time. And so I just, we don't understand why it was moved, what the reason is. Uh, we had a group of parents that met with some leadership of, of the high school, and we were told, we'll fix it with the bus schedule. I'm not sure how that's going to happen when you play at 515 in Dripping Springs or 630. We were told, well, we'll separate freshman JV and varsity. Well, that separates the sense of community that these girls have because they cheer each other on because a lot of people don't go to a basketball game or a volleyball game in Curveball or Birdie and battle the traffic. So that's another, that's a concern of ours if you separate the teams for cheering for each other. The other is we were told it works at other districts in, the, in San Antonio. It probably does because you're playing at Coleman or you're playing at Hero Stadium, you're playing at Paul Taylor, you have a 15 to 20 minute drive to get to those facilities. You don't have to go as far as we do. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is that we're not quite sure what this personalization period is. And we're wondering if you do too. Uh, it's 180 minutes a week that our child's going to be in with either a teacher or a coach? What's the agenda? What's going to happen? Why was this put in the year after COVID? It's a pretty big change. Uh, what, what did you vote on? Did the board vote on this change? Uh, really look into it because we're confused about it. We're not quite understanding and it's also affecting athletes. Athletes are getting the brunt of this. How does a multi-sport athlete going to be able to handle the personalization period as well? And is this the right time, right after a pandemic? And finally, my, my main reason for being here is one, to protect our daughters. Uh, it's going to be a lot of added stress. How do they figure out to get a successful practice in second period and go back to class? How do they get to the games? How do they cheer each other on? Well, we're one high school district. We're being compared to how other school districts do it in this city. The personalization period is being compared to how it was done in San Diego, actually, which is a client of ours. They have a lot of high schools. We're a one high school district. We're supposed to be different. And so there's plenty of time to fix this. There's plenty of time before school starts in August get the girls basketball and girls volleyball team back to last period and to really take a deep look at this personalization time. What's the true agenda of this? What is the reason for having it? Again, I appreciate all you do. Like I said, I go to a lot of more meetings. You're volunteering and I appreciate your time. And we're just here as a consultant. Thank you. Thank you. John Caparelletti and then next up will be Haley Beckham. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, well, I guess Mr. Wooden stole, stole my thunder, uh, <laughs> but I want to reiterate most of what he said. I'm a uh, parent of a uh, volleyball player as well, and uh, just here to voice my concerns about this uh, proposed block schedule or 
pose. I don't know if it's already set in stone, but uh, it does pose uh, a serious concern for uh, just generally the logistics for students, parents, teachers, coaches, and the shifting of how your schedule is structured. Uh, this is actually the first I've heard of it, the day before yesterday, that this was going to be implemented. Um, I'm really concerned about coming out of COVID implementing this new schedule that's going to, in my opinion, adversely affect athletes specifically, uh, moving their uh, their athletics period into the middle of the day uh, really inhibits their ability to focus on the sport while then uh, basically getting ready for their academics. Uh, implementing this personalization period, in my opinion, I'm still not, I haven't really wrapped my head around exactly what it is, but by having the coaches <coughs> be in charge of that while also mixing in the necessity for the students themselves to get ready for the rest of their academic day, um, I think it's just too much to put into, uh, the, the, onto them. I think it's overall just an adverse effect. Um, if logistically, like Cliff mentioned, um, having athletic periods uh, squeezed into the middle of the day, not, a, not on the tail end, I think is makes for a logistical nightmare. You mentioned us being a one uh, one school district and having to travel so much uh, to uh, for our district games. Multi high school uh, districts don't really have that issue, so I think it's something that the board should take into consideration before implementing such a large change to our everyday schedule because I mean we're we're all getting back to normal and, and trying to acclimate to our new our new world and to, so to have a to, such a drastic change like this in August and September I think it'll uh, it'll be rough on, on pretty much everyone. So thank you. Thank you. Haley Beckel, and then next will be Helen Morris. I'm going to read mine. I'm not as eloquent as these guys are speaking off the cuff. So uh, thank you all for allowing us to do this. We do appreciate your time. And um, here we go. So my name is Haley Beckel, and this will be my daughter's third year as a varsity volleyball athlete. I have many concerns about the new schedule at the high school, specifically how it relates to JV and varsity volleyball. While there are many questions about how the schedule came to be and why the schedule is being implemented after such a stressful year and the inequalities between athletes and non-athletes, I will focus on a few specifics that need to be addressed. First, this will be the third year my daughter has had a different schedule in high school. Her freshman year was a traditional 1-8 schedule, sophomore year was a version of block with alternating athletic period days, and now this. Change is difficult, as we all know, but it seems we are implementing unnecessary changes annually and without regard to the mental and physical health of our children. In addition, for the past two years, the volleyball team has not had a home gym and has been forced off campus for practice and games. And they did so willingly and without complaint. Throw in a pandemic and the disarray it brought and you have a team that has endured and persevered despite these challenges. Why then are we continually asking them to sacrifice? In anticipation of being brought back on campus and into a home gym, we are now asking these athletes to accept a new schedule that moves their athletic period from the end of the day to the 2-6 period. This is a period that has not ever been typically assigned to athletes and for good reason. During the fall semester, which is volleyball season, there's approximately nine away games. And as you know, our district of play is spread out across Texas. Typically, the team will need to leave school between 2.30 and 3.15 in order to travel to the away locations in a timely manner. With the new schedule, the volleyball athletes will need to leave their fourth, eighth academic period in order to compete. That means they will miss about nine class periods, which equates to 10 and a half hours of instruction, which is about 27% of an academic class. Okay, other athletes are not being asked for this sacrifice, and so I believe this is unacceptable. In addition, it's my understanding that the sports that are scheduled for the end of the day are off-campus sports that do not require gym space. Instead of a more normal, less stressful year without a pandemic and a shiny new gym, we're making the volleyball athletes year more cumbersome, stressful, 
with a schedule that just doesn't make sense. I beg the board to review the procedures of how the schedule came to be and to move athletics out of the 2-6 period. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Helen Morris and then Sarah Feldman. Yep, you're good. I'm Helen Norris, um, and I appreciate, obviously, the time here. I also appreciate that I live in a district that when I had a problem last week, when I became aware of the schedule, I had the privilege of meeting with the athletic director, the assistant athletic director, and the principal of the high school. So first and foremost, I'll say that is a privilege of living here, and I appreciate the time that was put into that. And we made some advances. I got some questions answered, but I was still left I know you don't have any spare time and you probably don't watch Ted Lasso, but I'm borrowing his quote from Walt Whitman, and that is, be curious, not judgmental. And I'm here to be curious. I'm curious about where we are going with our students. I am curious why I feel, as a parent of four children at every campus this year, one, I feel tired, but two, I, I feel empathetic for the teachers that are gonna have to deal with the schedule and the ramifications of the personalization period. But more than that, I feel for my children because I push them because I want them to do well. And we taught Profile Learner in 2005 when I first gave birth to Kieran, and I don't want to get emotional, but I'm here to tell you that we push them and we expect a lot out of them and we expect it on and off the court. And I do not feel like they are having the opportunity to thrive. I feel, I understand, I'm an educator, I work in SAISD, I understand that we need to serve the large portion of the population that needs attention. I am all for that. But I do not think it's a mutually exclusive decision. I think we can serve the high performer with the low performer. We are Alamo Heights. We can do this, and we can do it better than anyone else. But it is going to take time, and it's also going to take this camaraderie, this understanding of where we're coming from. In this particular instance, I felt more than ever before that I was met with a, a shielding of the schedule. Because in every conversation I had, it was, I don't want to share this with everyone, but I'm going to tell you. I don't really want this to be public knowledge, but I'm going to tell you. The reason why there's not 500 parents that are athletes is because they don't know. They think it's a simple block schedule or traditional schedule. Specifically, I'm going to leave you the calendar for the girls' volleyball. I'm going to leave you when buses left for the same games last year. Traffic isn't going to change. If anything, it's going to be worse. So I think that'll be a good place to start. You can realize that 12 hours of instruction, 10, 12, call it 15, one is too many for an advanced student to miss a class time, particularly going to a block schedule where we're trying to put two classes in one. I don't want my child who already stays up all night trying to be successful at everything she does to be penalized for being an AP student and being an athlete. I don't want her to miss any time. I don't want 12 hours, I don't want two hours. So please take a look at what we are proposing. Let personalization be equal for giving them the study hall to every student and athlete. Please. Hi there, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, I was here at the last school board meeting and I noticed that the majority of the uh, speakers during this portion um, talked about how and implied that we live in a very racist community and that really upset me and I moved here from Los Angeles almost nine years ago and I feel that this community does an excellent job of respecting and treating um, our neighbors of different races, background, ages, and sexual orientation very fairly. And on my block, we, we have representatives of all of those groups I just men mentioned, and we treat each other like family. Um, I also feel this school district does a good job of this with programs like Snack Packs and Pals. But that being said, I don't feel it's the school district's job to teach my kids social and emotional skills. It's their job to teach my kids academics. And I don't want teachers with different worldviews teaching my kids these skills, social and emotional. I want them to be taught not 
what to think, but how to think, both objectively and critically with room to question. Um, I don't know if you all saw it, but in the US News and World Report recently came out and Alamo, Alamo Heights High School was ranked 25th in academics in our city. And this did not include private schools. We're clearly taking, off, taking the focus off basic academics and failing our kids by doing so. Um, this brings up something else. I'd really like to know how much of our tax dollars recently went to the equity audit performed by One World Consulting. This audit is very personal to me because my fifth grader was pulled out without my consent and on a Zoom call that was videoed by the two founders of One World Consulting. This prompted me to do a little research on them and with a quick Twitter search, I found the following. Dr. Kelly Brown, professor working towards equitable outcomes for children through research and teaching, hashtag racial equity. Okay, this bothers me a little because I'm all for creating equitable um, opportunities, but we cannot guarantee outcomes for these people. Um, she recently retweeted an article that paints critical race theory in a positive light. Our governor has recently made the teaching of CRT illegal. On May 6th, she retweeted the following. Question, when does racism show up in public education? Answer, always. If you are a white person stating that your white colleagues are nice people does not preclude them or you from being an acting racist. Did anyone else do a quick Twitter search before we hired these people? Um, these don't seem like appropriate people to be doing an equity audit on our school. They already come in knowing and thinking that, it's, that we are racist. Our kids to summer programs and not 
be in financial hardship on us just for summer programs. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Carlos Brass is next and then Tori Richmond.
school should not teach our kids that skin color is more important than the content of their character. In fact, Alamo Heights School District teaches the eight character keys from kindergarten in order to instill goodness within our children. Why teach them that none of that matters now? It's all that matters. There is already a major focus on bullying in our district through David's legacy. If we can keep focusing on bullying and not pointing out more ways to convince our children that they are different, our kids, our district, our community will be better off in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. To everyone who spoke today, we are sincerely grateful that you took time and came. Uh, we value your input. We are now going to move on to item four of the agenda presentation of items for possible action. The next item on the agenda is uh, A, board goal two, AHISD profile of a learner. And we'll wait a couple of minutes for folks who want to leave. Emily, if you want to come get a position. There you go. Here you are. This has been a long time coming for Emily. She's been asking me about this trip for some time now. <laughs> so. Thank you. And if you're more comfortable sitting, hold the microphone. You can stand or sit. Decide. And at the outset, since we're going to hear about a bunch of trips, it's really nice to be getting presentation on school student trips again. So, yes. Lead off. I saw the list and I didn't hear why. Hi, I'm Emily Rangel. I teach culinary arts at Alma Heights High School. Um, this would be my third trip uh, with ACIS, which is um, a company who uh, Alma Heights has been using for uh, overseas travel for as long as I can remember. Um, my last trip was 2019, and during that trip, uh, I planned this next trip for 2021. Uh, typically, I uh, take a trip every other year. Uh, I leave. One of the only trips that are open to any student, even eighth grade, they want. Um, any grade, I should say. There's a, a typical senior trip every year, and then languages take trips. Um, with ACIS as well, but I think I'm the only one at the high school that does it. Who to go? Who Even parents. So um, it's pretty neat. We always have a lot of kids um, really interested and a lot of parents interested. Um, this trip was planned for 2021, so it has moved to next summer um, for July 11th through 19th, and I typically choose July because a lot of students uh, go to summer school in June. Um, and this is to Dublin. York, London, and Paris, and the students chose this um, when I was with them last time, so it's kind of neat that they flipped through the ACIS catalog and they chose this, so I think a lot of students would be interested in it if students themselves chose it. So uh, there's an overnight flight, um, and then we come back on the 19th. I love ACIS uh, because somebody travels with us and is with us the entire time, so I feel really safe. They're from the area, they speak the language. It's like having a travel agent. Uh, with you the entire time. So I feel great about it. I love ACIS. Um, what's super neat and sets them apart is what's included in the price is flights, hotels, breakfasts, and dinners, um, and every single fun and learning event that we do um, while we're there. And so some of the fun trips uh, would be in Dublin. We have a leprechaun museum, um, a ghost tour in New York, um, we board the 180 mile per hour Eurostar to Paris, which is super cool. The kids are like, super cool about that. Uh, we get to uh, have the 10K lesson in Paris as well. We also get to go to the Louvre and cut the line, um, since we are a school trip. Uh, we cut the line and get up as close as you can get to Mona Lisa, which is super awesome. We get to see the Westminster Abbey, Westminster Abbey, uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral, and much more. So um, I have no fear that we won't get filled with this trip since kids are itching to get out as well. Um, we Our goal is at least 12, and for every six student there will be adults, because um, every six students, adults can go for free. So um, I love that we can control the kids. My first trip I had three students, which was amazing. Um, the next one was 12, and we had two uh, to go. Um, 
So I do have a lot of uh, teachers that are interested in going with me. That's great. And I'm just ready to get the word out and start talking about it and see who's all interested. Do you have any questions? I mean, I'm new to this, so what are you asking of us? Just we have to approve the trip? Yes. Yep. Well, it's not approval anymore. From the board, we can change that. And so it's just a presentation if you all, so you can ask some questions if you have any concerns, uh, clarifications. Questions or well, what's great about this year is that ACIS changed their protection plan, so parents can pull out if they need to because of COVID and things uh, four days before we leave for the trip and get a full refund, which is the first time they've ever done that. So that's great. I know that that's going to be kind of a, a sticky situation with parents is the is the payment um, and if they can get refunded if something happens wherever we go. Because I know parents a little handling things a little differently, so we'll just, we have a lot of time to. And do we offer scholarship opportunities for this? Through ACIS there is. There. Um, we don't have the schools, but ACIS, the company does, yeah. That's great. So we do just remind you that it is a school-sponsored trip, and so it's school standards and yes. of expectations. We are so busy throughout the day, there's no room for shenanigans. And so the kids are exhausted when they get there, and a lot of parents are like, what if they sneak out of their hotel room? I'm like, they're fast asleep before I am because we're exhausted every day. So I don't, uh, again, this is my third trip, and I've never had one problem. So I'm really happy about that. Thanks for your work, but Mr. Bennett. Yeah. Right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Our next presentation is the trip uh, Girls Golf National High School Golf Association invitation. Andrews 
the Tens Arc Tournament uh, here at the, the uh, Swing Fit and Cure. Well, good luck. Yeah. You, bet, you bet we're That's excited. So I know probably Dr. Chair and Coach Redman have probably just like nailed this down a hundred times, but I just want to make sure when it's a small group and we got parents and families going, it, it, it can get a little fuzzy as to why we're there. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows we need to model the, the character and the way that we compete at tournaments for our lines. Absolutely. We plenty of times have a family vacation in North Carolina. We're going there to make all the tournaments. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a, it's a uh, kind of liken it to a bowl game college bowl game, uh, you have programs that to get invited to a bowl game is, is a reward, and uh, they kind of truly see it that way, and then you have programs that we're in that position, we need to, we need to go win. And I think from since the last day of school until right up, I've got girls coming back from national tournaments on Saturday, we're gonna meet briefly on Sunday, they're, they've been all over the country already playing, so they should be. I, I, I thought about, do I have practice? Do I, well, I couldn't have had a practice. They're all over the country playing, which is, that that's as good a practice as you're gonna get. They'll, they'll very definitely be in that frame of mind. They're just not gonna use it. And I noticed on the itinerary, you're not playing Pinehurst number two? So, Coach Bergner is the only one that's going to get to go play Pinehurst number two. They offered that for uh, the coaches and assistants, and the girls could have played it also. Um, it was pretty expensive. And then as a coach, you're kind of stuck between, back to, back to uh, uh, what David mentioned, is, is it a true reward or are you going there to win? Well, Pinehurst number two is considered one of the top five hardest golf courses in the country. And so do you put them on that for a practice round and <laughs> and take a beat down and then go try to go try to perform at your best and, and just just to what the girls we we're gonna do our practice round on one of the courses we will actually play and we'll we'll let Coach Berger tell us how he shot nine. <laughs> well good luck. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate you guys very Thanks. much. Thank you. Okay, next up we have the Alamo Heights High School Choir Student Trip. And this is Eric Camasso. This is not David Short. He's going to stand in for David tonight. Thanks for being here. Hello. Uh, my name is Eric Camasso, and I currently serve as the Director of Orchestras at the high school. Uh, I come to, to you tonight to talk to you a little bit about a trip that David Short and I are planning for um, March 2022. Um, this it will be a joint combined trip with the choir and the orchestra. As part of the trip, students will experience world class performances for museums and explore culturally and historically significant sites that are specific to New York City. We both believe in student travel being a wonderful enrichment to our students' education in Alamo Heights. The trip will be five nights beginning the weekend before spring break, and we are doing this as a means for students to not miss school. Um, Highlights of the trip include performances at um, Broadway musicals, an attendance at the New York Philharmonic with, for the orchestra, a tour of the National September 11th Memorial and Museum, Li Liberty and Ellis Islands, a tour of the United Nations, Radio City Music Hall, a workshop led by experienced Broadway performers for the choir, and a performance for the orchestra at St. Paul the Apostle Church. Um, the price estimate for each student is $1,900 and includes air and ground transportation, hotel, sightseeing, most meals, and all taxes and gratuities. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, our choir and orchestra families were anticipating out-of-state travel to New York City in the spring of 2021. In a recent survey, families of both programs enthusiastically responded with interest, to, with interest in a March 2022 trip. The cost of the trip will be broken into five payments spread throughout the fall semester. Students will have an opportunity for fundraising at the start of the 2021-2022 school year, and both Mr. Short and myself are working with a fundraising um, person to, to, to kind of plan something that they have, through their experience, has been um, a high profit. Um, the price point of the tour aligns with previous out-of-state trips that the music programs at Alamo Heights have taken in the past. Each program will have at least two directors traveling with the group, as well as at least, at least one chaperone for 10 students. Chaperones will be taken through a training on how to appropriately and effectively care for the well-being of students while traveling through the guidance of our teachers and our travel agency, Bob Rogers Travel. 
Bob Rogers Travel has been selected based on the choir's previous experience with the company on this exact trip. Additionally, the company is working with vendors to ensure that we are following all COVID protocols set forth by airlines, hotels, and all involved. To be secure, Bob Rogers has also provided a trip assurance program that works with vendors to ensure participants will be refunded as much of their payment as possible, which is 100% minus um, security deposits. If our trip is canceled due to circumstances beyond our control, so, such as changes in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you for your time and to your continued support of Allen Heights music programs. And I can answer any questions if you have any. How, ma how many students typically go? Between the two of us, we're anticipating around 70. 70, 70 students. Yes. That's awesome. So we've not done a joint luck. trip like this <laughs> in my mind. We've not done a joint trip like this. For, this oh, no, no. This, this will be the first time we're, we're going together. Um, the, we're going together as part of the travel agency, but our trips are actually um, backwards. So we'll be staying at separate hotels. We'll be doing the same things, just my stuff at the start of the trip is his end of the trip, and we'll just be flip hopping. And they will be having a Broadway workshop with um, experienced performers, and we'll be performing in New York City. That will be advertised and open to the public in New York. So I'm excited to put Alamo Heights out there, outside of San Antonio and outside of Texas. So this is technically a presentation for number three and for number five. Right, I was going to say it okay. covers five, too. Mm -hmm. We won't make you come up and do it. Yeah. <laughs> is that a spring break? The week before? Yeah, it's over, over spring, spring break. break. We'll start spring the weekend break before spring, spring break and go into spring break. Spring break, really that early? That's what everybody's asking. March 3rd, spring break. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, quick question. I, I noticed in your letter, you, you break down the costs and the check-in dates and all that sort of thing. Um, and all the opportunities for fundraising, which I think is great. Sure. And I would just encourage y'all to promote the fundraising part so that certain, any children aren't right. discouraged because there's a price tag on there and they haven't seen a dollar amount in the comment. And right. I want to make sure that everybody feels the opportunity that this fundraising is for me. I can go. Exactly, and well, uh, once we kind of sign our contract and all of those things, um, we'll have a parent presentation um, with the travel agent who will be on the trip with us, and myself and Mr. Short will also be able to present at that point um, the fundraising opportunities to, to cut the cost for, for parents. So to clarify, you're leaving March 3rd, which is a Thursday evening. Yes. And so you're traveling Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the spring break prior yeah. week. Yes, yes, you were giving us all. We're not ready for spring break. Oh, I'm not sure. We need a little more. I don't know. I'm ready for spring break. Are you part yeah. of that? Correct. So, just curious is, sure. is the. So, we're talking 140,000, right? I mean, fossil metals. Yes. It is. When you say you're going to fundraise, would the presentation be to the families like if we raise 50 grand, it's split evenly? Or is it the people that really need that $1,900? Sure. So the fundraising opportunities will be students will fundraise for themselves. So um, like if we're selling tumblers or their popcorn, the amount of money that or the amount of sales that the student gets will directly get that into their personal account and their 1900 will come down. So it won't be spread across everybody. Um, each student will be able to work for themselves, if that makes sense. It does. Any other questions? Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks, Eric. And um, for the next presentation, it's Dr. Maria Crab is going to present yes. instead of um, Rebecca Marshburn. Okay, so next we've got the Alamo Heights High School ACES student trip to Spain, and we have Dr. Maria Cubero to present, please. Hi, I'm here on behalf of Rebecca. We are going to use the same company that the uh, featured uh, on the Euro trip. Um, the purpose of our trip is like to give to the students an opportunity to connect what they learn uh, with a real life experience. Okay? So they are going to visit in some regions in Spain um, that we teach in class about art culture and literature. Okay. Then uh, we will visit cities and towns in Spain that have a significant importance to the story, culture, and art we have studied in the classroom. At each stop, we will discuss the relevance of 
what we are visiting to what has been uh, studied in the Spanish classes. Also, we will have a tour director with us for the entire trip uh, once we land in Madrid. The itinerary will be from July 5th to July uh, 12th. Um, she is like uh, thinking on half like between 10 or 20 Spanish students, including the, some parents or siblings. Maria, is it any level Spanish student? Um, she didn't tell me, but I think it's most of the AP classes. Yeah, okay. Because that's the that's classes that they can uh, speak Spanish there, and they can like they're going to understand. I think no, the test. You typically aren't understand. taking me here, so I was just. So she's thinking in the AP classes. So it's only open to t uh, students in Spanish. It wouldn't be like if someone else wanted to go that's not taking Spanish. It wouldn't be open to them. No, only students that are taking Spanish. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right, in our last presentation, we have public education in the San Antonio area. Mr. Bobby Blunt is here. Bobby, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, fellow board members. I was going to say, it's kind of different for you to be on this side of the table, right? <laughs> it is. It's enjoyable, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not to be. And, and just sort of staying with the theme, uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about briefly is how you can take a trip here in San Antonio to all different public school districts. Nice. But before I do that, uh, just a quick background for uh, our, our trustees, our superintendent, uh, our staff, and the, uh, the public that's here. Uh, and this is being done by the Bear County School Board Coalition. For those that don't know, the Bear County School Board Coalition was started in 2005. It's only four trustees in Bear County. So we count the 15 official ISDs that are identified with San Antonio and Bear County, plus five that have a portion of it. So it's an organization, we established a corporation, so this is its own 501c3 uh, that's established just for us to be collaborate, to work together, and, and do things like I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, in addition, the other major part of it that we're going to talk about is Go Public is actually under the Bear County School Board Coalition. Many may not be aware of that. Go Public is a campaign. It's not a separate corporation. It's a very important advocacy uh, that we're doing, but it falls under the Bear County School Board Coalition. So some of the recent things that we have done under the coalition itself is uh, uh, we have had opportunity to uh, advocate for our state and actually for our nation. Just to give an example, when we last year we were trying to figure out how to return to school and some other things, uh, the state wanted to get, from a school district perspective, uh, what our thoughts were, what should occur policy-wise and some, uh, funding-wise, et cetera. Uh, we came together to represent San Antonio to say, Governor, this is what we think would be best, okay? And that's an example of the activity. The reason why we're able to do that is because there's very few other regions across the state that can get together and really advocate the whole group. Uh, sometimes the health calls like Houston does that also. But that's one of the values that we have as, as a coalition. Our latest adventure, to keep it short, that I want to talk about is we've been working for two years on producing this book entitled uh, Public Education in the Sanitarian Area. Actually, this thing over earlier would prefer to call it This Is How You Do It, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> but the book itself, what it actually does, and again, this was done by the trustees as lead, and uh, we had the Education Service Center that helped us out, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, uh, the district contacts such as Patty have been always very helpful. Uh, so it was a lot of individuals and organizations that helped out. Uh, the chapters, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, they include background about the county um, data. We didn't do each individual district. We want to show San Antonio and Bear County as a whole. Each of the district has the opportunity to do highlights about its district, two or three pages in that regard. The other key thing, and I said two years, so we got interrupted by, I think we know all too well, but we talk about the first 60 days of the pandemic. It's trying to document pictures or this is what we had to react to, food service, mental health, et cetera, et cetera, type of aspects. And then it gives a whole history and aspects of Go Public, too, so that's finally documented, too. So that's sort of the content. Uh, this is book number two. We did one 10 years ago. Uh, it was then more focused on fact. This one really is meant to be a marketing and highlight to talk about the, uh, the districts themselves. So that's the, the booklet. We have it, as you think you know, on Amazon and other places to be able to obtain for purchase. Uh, so we encourage those that would like to do that. Um, a couple other things to let you know. On Friday, we're actually going to be 
presenting. We as trustees in the uh, San and Bear County area at the TAS BSLI, and this will be the major focus, is talking to other districts, how you tell your story, how you work together to build that. So that's at 115 that we'll be doing that part of it. And the next week we have a go public next Thursday. I hope you all have heard about that. I want to get all the trustees and everybody else also involved and get our we have, annually we have a meeting just to update everybody and talk about the future direction. Thanks to a couple of folks. I definitely want to thank Dana. She's been on the Go Public Steering Committee and has been really, really uh, giving a lot of feedback and helping out with the dir uh, direction itself. So that's my. Uh, so I just want to make sure everybody knows Bobby. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, we can start with that. Um, okay, so he's a long term serving um, trustee of Northside Independent School District that is just a true champion uh, for the public schools across the state, but um, most especially in this area in Bear County. And it's very unique. Um, to have a, a situation, a, an organization like this that you've um, led and structured and kind of shepherded all of us through um, to, to promote this kind of unique partnership. And so I want to just make sure all of you, even some of our new trustees, know who you are, Robbie. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I don't worry about that well, part. It's the impact. I'd like to make a quick comment. Yeah. I want to thank you for your service this past year with the coalition in particular because uh, the value that you delivered to us as trustees was huge. Thank you. In terms of having to navigate so many different voices, so many different concerns, and trying to get touch points for a lot of different decision makers and policy makers. So, you know, I don't know that we had an opportunity to thank you, and so I'm glad to do it, you know, here during our board meeting, but thank you for everything you did over this past year. Well, appreciate it. And we, again, so all trustees, we want to be a part of it, but thanks for that. Okay. Uh, I was wondering about the, the book. What is the target audience? Whose hands are we hoping to get these books? And I know you said it's on Amazon. You know, what population would be going into, into buying it? Are we distributing it in different areas, trying to persuade parents to go public? What's the? Yeah, it's, it, it's actually um, a natural official. We're going to start next week to build kickoff in the, in the campaign. But we do want parents to have it. We want libraries to have it. Uh, we want legislature to have it. We want folks that are coming in new to the city to have it because it gives such a good background about our public ISDs. Uh, we want the leadership in San Antonio uh, to really have it so they're, they're stating the true facts of what's occurring with, uh, within our, uh, our county, et cetera, as well as all the school districts. So to be out, we sort of open it so that there's a very broad audience of both individuals and organizations. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank I you all again. Thank, thank you very you. much. All right, our next item is consideration of adopting the AHISD District of Innovation Renewal Plan for 2021 through 2026. Dr. Frank Alfaro, you've presented on this repeatedly. This is it. That's right. That's right. I'd like to, uh, uh, Bobby's still on, but I want to give him a shout out. I was working with him. That guy is on a lot of boards. He's a public servant. I was working with uh, the youth orchestras of San Antonio, Rosa West, and I was asking, uh, what is his uh, child's plan? He's going to have a kid in the U.S. I said, like, well, you know, yeah, he's serving. And somebody asked him to be on it. I forgot who asked him to be on the board. But I was like, so well, nice. that his own personal child was playing soccer somewhere, and he was trying to help this youth orchestra. So he's just a great public servant. Uh, very humble as well. <clears throat> Uh, well, I, I'm going to actually do a little bit of a formal thing because this is actually the, the consideration where I'm asking you all to do. And so for the general public as well, uh, the District of, of Innovation is a, um, a status that the legislature passed as several legislative sessions ago that was designed to give school districts increased flexibility in a variety of different uh, statutory mandates. And the idea was that uh, if you gave districts flexibility in certain things, it allowed them to be more innovative uh, based on whatever their uh, particular community mission was. And so when this first came about, we actually jumped on it, and uh, I, it was actually, you, we did it in December, so it's kind of like a mid-year thing, but we developed our plan, and it was approved by the trustees, and we went through the exact same process that I had to follow this time. And so what I want to remind everybody in the public as well as the trustees is that we have already gone through uh, one iteration of distributed of innovation. The school board at that time approved it at that time. And now I'm simply coming back to renew it because it's only good for five years. And so the statute requires that you have to renew it for the next five years. 
And so technically, our old one isn't up until December of 2021, but because we didn't have to do it mid-year, we went ahead and got ahead of it to do it now, so now we'll be on a regular school year cycle. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, uh, there are very specific exemptions you can get from various statutes, uh, but they're all, they also say each of some certain statutes you, you cannot get exempt from. And they're what you can imagine, right? They're all the ones that we wish we could exempt from, but you can't, like finance, uh, certain curriculum requirements, state assessment, accountability, anything that the feds require, uh, things like that, like district governance, uh, you can't get a waiver to say, or of course, doesn't have to be all the time. Uh, I wish you, right, you wish you could, but go to the next one now. Uh, there are some very uh, helpful ones that we've used over the years, and I wanna highlight those. Um, I don't know if a lot of people recall this anymore, but uh, there is a state law that says you can't start school before a certain time. Uh, well, this gives us the flexibility to do that, and we've done it for several years, and our community really appreciates being able to start school earlier than the law requires, so that you can get out of it, right? Now, the other thing is that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, red tape that we have to do with various rules and things, uh, like class size waivers. And so uh, we know typically that in Spanish immersion, which is a great program we've had for several years, um, it's really important to have a, uh, a critical mass of students in that all the way through so they can benefit from having a critical mass of kids. And so you have to build it big early on because at some point people will move out, that kind of thing, and you, you naturally plan attrition going up the ladder, like when they get older, like in the junior school and high school. And so you have, you have to build it like 25, 26 uh, lower. Well, because we do that, you traditionally have to get class size waiver. We don't have to do that, and that saves us a little bit of time administratively. Uh, there you go, came back. Uh, I'm not even talking about the third one. It's not, it's just this. The statute requires that you designate one de uh, behavior coordinator on campus, but we all know that that's uh, <coughs> Uh, not the way we do this, right? Every uh, administrator on the board works with counselors and teachers to do it collaboratively, and so we don't have to name one person, we can do it collaboratively. Um, we also have a high need areas in some really uh, uh, areas where uh, we can have the opportunity to have a great teacher who just happens not to be certified. And so with this one, we specify two areas, and only two areas, that we would not have to have a state certified teacher. And the first is languages other than English. And so uh, the great example of this is somebody who moves over from France, who actually taught university in France, but is not certified to teach French here, but is a great teacher. Well, this allows us to have a French teacher that does that, and we employ that ourselves. Likewise, in career and technology education classes, that's a prime example of somebody from the field who's not traditionally a teacher, but who really has a lot to give to the students. So the example there is somebody who was a restaurateur, a cook at a restaurant, has the opportunity to teach in our culinary arts class, along with Emily Renghel, and that person is not traditionally certified, but does a really great job. And so that flexibility, we've uh, been fortunate enough to use. And so I do want to underline to everyone that we only waive uh, from certification in those two specific areas, not in any other areas. Uh, then the next one that's been uh, really useful for us is that uh, there are rules about teacher contracts, and if you have experience coming into the district, uh, uh, the normal rules are that you only get one year probationary contract, and then you have to determine whether that person goes on term contract or not. Typically, if you're a brand new teacher, you get three years of probation. Now, what's important about that is that it gives uh, the district and the new employee time to make sure that this is gonna be a good fit or not. Full three years probation is great because you can work through it to see if this is gonna be a good fit or not. That one year quick, if you've been experienced five out of the last eight years in another public school district, you only get one year probation. Well, with the District of Innovation flexibility, we can add an extra year of probation in case we need it, uh, just to make sure it's the right fit. We spend a lot of time making sure we have high quality uh, instructors hired into this district, and this gives us an opportunity to just make sure that that's the case. Um, so we appreciate that. And then the last thing that was really helpful was a loophole that some other districts uh, were able to find and 
being part of this uh, organization that we're a part of, we realized uh, that uh, we could take advantage of, which was um, for districts our size, way back in the day, um, there was only uh, people, uh, health care providers were dropping us left and right. And it was really difficult for school districts our size to find a health care provider. And so the state scrambled at the state level and created something called TRS Active Care, which was meant to be a state uh, medical, uh, they partnered with Blue Cross, I think originally went to Edmond, I was back at Blue Cross. Um, but to give folks like us the opportunity to have medical insurance for your employees. But at that time they said, once you're in, you can't get out. And so we got in because that's the only person, people we could get insurance with, but then we were locked in with them. And we had to compete with bigger districts like Northeast, Northside, SAIC. They were able to get different kinds of insurance, and so that's always difficult. Well, with through a district of innovation, we were able to get an alternative medical insurance for our employees this year that had a substantially lower premium. Now, not everybody jumped over into that. There were still uh, several folks in active care, but it was a great opportunity for us to provide that um, to our employees because we are time and time again that um, healthcare premiums are something that's really hard for teachers. Uh, and so that gave us flexibility. Next slide. Uh, and so the statutory process is lengthy. Those of you that have been around have seen this. The new brokers might not have seen this. But the process begins way back uh, in March when I do a public kind of calling and you guys pass a resolution to let the public know that we're looking into this. Then I meet with our district site-based team, which is called the District Education Advisory Council, the DEAC, and we actually go through the exact plan. It's the same plan we had last time, we just updated it with dates. And everybody said, yes, unanimously, we want to proceed with it. That's the next step. And then we come back to you all for more formal hearings. I've had it posted on the website since April the 19th, so I've met that time commitment. And then after the May board meeting, I sent a note to uh, no, an email to the commissioner saying, "Hey, our board officially said we're interested in pursuing this." That's the, the last part of the process. Now, with your consideration, if you all approve, then I will now send uh, another thing to the to the commissioner saying that our board has voted to re up for another five years, and then it becomes official after that. Now, are there any questions about the district innovation? Um, and we have heard about this a few times now, so most of it I think I know, but um, on, on things like the class size waiver and, um, and certification, I think you were more specific about that one. Uh, say class size waiver, the, what we're voting on today when we approve this plan, the class size waiver is, is specific to Spanish immersion, right? I mean, in four years you wouldn't be able to use our district innovation status to up the class sizes on other areas. I mean, is that correct, what we're voting on? That, that is not correct. Not Let correct. me specify. Okay. So the, what the state law says is that every class of fourth grade and under, if you uh, exceed 22, you have to submit paperwork to the state to say we need a waiver from that rule about 22. So it's important to know before we even did this, that in, in, this is all throughout the state of Texas, uh, uh, every district that had a class fourth grade or below that was uh, over 22 had to submit a paperwork to the state. It didn't stop anybody from doing it, they did it, you just had to submit stuff so they had a record of how many classes below, at fourth grade or below were over 22. Typically in our situation, uh, we uh, uh, the only ones we built to be over 22 explicitly were Spanish immersion. But it doesn't mean we couldn't somehow. Now I want to remind everybody what we build our class sizes on. So at kinder, we go 18 to one. First grade is 19 to one. Second grade is 20 to one. Third grade is 21 to one. And fourth grade is 22 to one. And so we already build in below that 22 anyway. And so it would be an odd instance in which anything would go over that. that thank you, that does answer it. So yeah. the plan, what we're giving permission for is broader than what you intend that is correct. To use it for, but we are we are giving approval for something that, you know, it gives it does, it would give you that opportunity. Okay, that means what about for secondary? It doesn't. No, the, the, yeah, statute is only about fourth and below. Got it. 
Like in other words, say so. Uh, so the statute says you have to fourth grade ribbon. <laughs> There's no limits, and so. The district innovation plan does not have anything to do with class size waivers for older. Just yeah, doesn't. class size waivers do not exist statutorily beyond fourth grade. There's not a class size mandate yeah, there's no beyond mandate. fourth grade. So, so historically, we have only used this provision for our, our immersion classes. Right. But like Frank's saying, you know, down the road, if we had one go over, we wouldn't have to go through the paperwork trail. But we haven't used that. The intent of it is to use it for language programs. Yeah. That, that that's all of that answers the questions yeah. I have. That's a great question. Thank you. Were there any comments since the posting, any comments from parents or the public or anything since it was posted? Okay, do I have a motion to approve the resolution to renew district of innovation status? So moved. David, do I have a second? Carrie? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We meet the two thirds. We pass. Thank you. Well done, Frank. I'll send a note to what? Can I say finally? Yeah, I know. I mean, finally. Can you put that next one to do it just for a second? Maybe. Maybe it's time to start over again. Five months of work. Yeah. Okay, next we are going to move on to item number five, the consent agenda. These are items that are considered routine by the board or have been previously reviewed and discussed in prior meetings and that we therefore enact in one motion. Is there anything that any of the board members would like to remove from the consent agenda to consider as an item on the regular agenda? Okay. Um, I will is, let you know before we move from the consent is that you have an updated Region 20 commitment form yeah, that was awesome. missing our co op um, right here, right? counselor services. So in your original board book, you had everything except for the counseling service co op mm -hmm. that's added there for your review. So that's okay. something we've used in the past. Um, yep. It supports our counselors with professional development. So. Okay, and one thing worth noting is we have a total of sixty thousand, more than sixty thousand dollars in donations, and in particular, uh, two of them, a thirty-seven thousand dollar donation from Edward Hart for the Alamo Heights High School baseball team as a result of baseball derby. That's a pretty outstanding fundraising, and also uh, we ought to acknowledge the donation from the Alamo Heights Junior School PTO. Uh, nearly twenty thousand dollars for curriculum grants. Uh, that kind of support support is much needed and very very much appreciated. Anything else? Anyone want to pull anything? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So Lisa, uh, second. Brian, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes. We've got a board member committee report, but it's not on here, so we don't have to do that. There are no business recommendations to address. So we are up to section A, calendar review. Okay, then Alicia is gonna project the calendar for you. Um, coming up next week, we have our second lunch and learn for our new trustees um, as part of orientation. And so that's on Tuesday, June 22nd, and Lisa will be there for that. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about um, the work that we've done with grading, kind of bring everybody up to speed. Um, Wednesday, all trustees are invited to come to a morning invited. meeting where we go through. <laughs> invited, did you like that? Invited, invited to. Yeah, I like that. Uh, we just need some more focused time with you all about budget. Um, prior, typically we don't have that meeting. We wait until August to do it, but we need to especially look at um, some salary considerations um, then as well. Um, Okay, I got stumped there. What was the July 1st special call board meeting on July 1st? Is the, it's the, it's the personnel. We always hold that in July. It seems early to me, but um, we always hold it prior to the last, the date for resignation. So we get our final swoop of, of hires in. And so that will be a 20 minute meeting. It will just be, but I need to make sure. Most most trustees, we just need four of you. So I'd love. Do we have four people? I will not be here. I'll be here. I'll be here. One, two, three. I, I can come. You can come? Okay. Yeah. okay. So we've got four. So it's almost my birthday, okay. so I want cake. We all, we do it <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I won't be here Tuesday. 
if we got four on um, that day, we're good. We, that's pretty much how we roll on that July yeah, meeting, is it's just to part. let people in and out of their contract. So uh, we close, y'all. Our offices close for a whole week out of the year. July, no, you know what? We didn't do that last year, so oh. I don't think we should continue that. <laughs> yeah, we didn't don't do that last year. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Most of us worked. Year. Most of us kept working. <laughs> All right, um, we host our third Lunch and Learn for our new trustees on Tuesday, August 3rd, and that's, um, yes. we're gonna go over community-based accountability, and Stacy, you're still able to be there, okay. Um, GNP, this is early, y'all. Remember that we moved up the, the typical flow of our morning meeting and our regular called meeting because we need to make the decision about calling for the TRE, the tax ratification election, by that, I think it's the 12th, Twelve. So we had to move up the regular board meeting, so we moved up the GMP. So just make sure I'll, I'll continue to shoot you those dates and the updates. Um, regular board meeting on the twelfth. So we're gonna have a lot. We're gonna see each other a lot. That, that. Is there time um, on the twenty third to go snoop around at the other facility? The tw the June twenty third. Uh -huh. After the it may be too long of a meeting. Maybe that's not fair. We could, I wanted to tour you the um, the so athletic complex, yeah. yeah. Do y'all want to do that that day? That's the day, I'll, I mean, I have to cut out, that's the day I told you I'll, I'll be oh, there. Oh, yes. Just, it may only be an hour. Okay, let me see, you guys can which day are we talking about? The 23rd. Well, okay. I, I just can throw that out there, you know. So if we don't do it then, Carrie, we will do it on August 11th at the board team okay. building. That's what we did last year, okay. we kind of I have time. a tour on the 23rd. I don't even know if my wife told me about it. I got, is that not the same thing? I don't have a tour down, so you're in a special touring group. Are we mule something? Well, not that I know about. So. Okay, I don't feel tired. Okay. All right, and then finally, y'all, what Bobby mentioned, I want to make sure you got this in your folder last Wednesday, but Go Public is sponsoring another breakfast for trustees and communication, and that's next, that's June 24th at 8 o'clock at Northside. And so, if you feel like you can attend with me, would you please email Alicia? And we, so it's June 24th, 8 a.m. It'll be 8 to 9.30. You've attended with me in the past. Some of you have been able to. Those are cool. You can go to it. Where is it again? It's, at the, it's in Northside. I don't have the specific, uh, but I will send it to you once you've But I, All I have to say about that meeting, if it's in the same place it was last time, get there early because it's a hike. That was Judson, do you remember? Oh we my gosh, Judson. yes. That was yes. a Judson time. Last year. Yeah. It was, it was so far from the parking lot to the thing it that was. I missed part of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not there this time? It's not there. Okay. June, June 24th, 8 a.m. If you can go, time. you're going to email Alicia. If you would like to, we can meet at Central Office and I can drive us. Okay. Oh, yeah. I could let you drive my car. <laughs> that would be better. Okay, any questions about calendar? Nope, that sounds good. All right. Section 9. Your uh, superintendent's communication. You mean a disconnect? There you go. <coughs> 90 88. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia, you're doing a great job. Right? Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, believe it or not, there's a lot that has taken place since we've met last in May. There's a lot of June updates that I have for you. Um, every meeting that we have had together since we opened our schools, we spent time going over our progress indicators. And I'm not going to get into many of the details around this, but I do want to highlight for you um, some areas of, of academic focus that we are, are looking at as part of our comprehensive needs assessment. And so you all know that we've tracked active cases. Um, we've been open summer school last two weeks and we have not had any active cases. It's great news. We track our zip code data. We track our st um, teachers and their vaccination. We had a partnership tonight with the National Guard and we had great um, turnout for people in the community that wanted to come and get vaccinated. So that's exciting. Um, you know, we tracked the number of students that were in Heights at Home versus face-to-face. -face. We tracked attendance over the whole year, um, had great attendance because of the way we were able to provide families with some flexibility in submitting forms and, and engaging on Google um, Classroom. Um, this, this just tracked the absent forms, the absentee forms. But I, I do want to sit 
in the student achievement piece because it sets us up for our goal setting and, and intervention needs for next year. And so we have tracked over the course of, of the year all of the, um, the failure rates, both the junior school and high school, and you can see that those failure rates are higher than they've been before, um, but they have decreased over the course of the year. And you can also see the comparison that we've tracked between students who were not making academic progress in the Heights at Home setting versus face-to-face. -face. So again, just you know, put that in context, we had fewer and fewer students in Heights at Home as the year progressed, but you can see that the failure um, rate maintained was pretty stable. And when you say failure rate? Failing one or more courses. So that's the percentage of students who fail one or more courses? Mm -hmm. So like 16% of our students fail one or more courses. At the end of one of the first nine weeks. At the end of the first yeah. nine weeks. So didn't fail the course, failed that, you know. They were failing right. at the time. Right. Okay. Um, we also got just recently preliminary um, star oh. scores. Now, I'm again, I'm sharing all of this with you just to say like, this is the entry point that we start getting all the data from the year so that we can make those academic goals um, as we walk through those campus checkups for next year. And so um, you can see, I wonder how large that was for you to see, just the percentage of students based on 2019 versus 2021, because you remember we didn't have star data last year. And so um, this is the percentage of students at approaches or higher, and approaches is, is meeting standard. Wow. So you can see that you know, there's some gaps, but there are surprisingly non gaps as well. And so, what and then, ES? this is end of elementary. course. Elementary. It's elementary, right? ES. Oh, elementary, elementary school math, elementary, elementary, elementary school reading. Yep. Yeah. Junior <coughs> school math, junior school reading. The junior school math, like, wow, that's surprising. What's Isn't that the, surprising? I'm so surprised by that. What's the orange? 19? The orange is 19. Mm -hmm. in the, in the Blue, Blue is 2021, 20, this year. Algebra 1 kind of struggled a little bit, but then bio was... So Algebra 1, you all know, it's been something we've been talking about um, over time now, that <coughs> I continue to be hopeful that that block schedule is going to help us fix because we can double block kids um, into that course who need that acceleration. So what's the difference between a real score and a preliminary score? Um, they... <laughs> Uh, it only it's includes the on well no here it comes down to online administration so it's just kids that took it online there are kids that were able to take it off but not online um, but paper pencil because of accommodations and so this is just the online testing it's like the early folks then it is but I'm gonna tell you go that's few and, like, those are so months. minimal in our district paper that there's pen. not gonna be that yeah. much change yeah. Okay. yeah and then um, just a quick glance at some preliminary college career and military readiness scores. They look at SAT. Now, our, our data will not come to us until August, so this is 2020 SAT exam data, and you can just see that we are above, and we have been, above the state, above the national mean score, and above the benchmark score. This is a bit of a celebration here. I'm going to try to zoom into this, but our mean score, our composite mean score on ACT is just trending, continues to trend upwards which is a celebration, especially with some of the challenges that we're facing. And then you can also see this uh, PSAT score. So how, does, how do those PSAT and SAT roughly compare to past years? So do you have that kind I don't of have that tonight, I don't. Okay. But um, we definitely look at that as part of that pillar one when we're setting our goals around student achievement in CVAS. That's something we look at every year. Um, I'm not going to go through college <coughs> this, but I do want you to look at this because this kind of shows some of the needs that we feel like, A, we're addressing right now in summer school by offering more students opportunity to remediation um, in summer school, but also needs as we move forward into next year as far as the screener data beginning, middle, and end of year. And so this is incorrect here. This is, we're gonna get, we can give Jimmy Walker you know, a hard time for not being here tonight and making one mistake in her life. This is 1920 data. <gasps> um, but as you look at it, it's beginning of year literacy and math, middle of year literacy and math, and end of year literacy and math. Um, and so we just have some targeted areas of need that you see highlighted here in yellow that we will meet through intervention. So wait, now, that 1920 meaning while everyone was shut down at home, we they did were doing assessments. that much higher mm -hmm. than they are a year later? 
Maybe it's because everybody. Because I, I can see Jimmy. I mean, she wouldn't have given. I can see her giving us the last normal year there, and that's that would be. You know a what, Stacy? I have to be on record loud and clear on the microphone. Jimmy's Jimmy right. did not make a make a mistake. You are totally be right. Because here's what happened. Is we did be, beginning. You tweeted out to her. She's in Mexico. You let her know. I said. I'm live streaming it. Nice. Because she and I go round and round about not wanting to admit mistakes. So I'll go ahead and tell her that. Um, we did that year of closure. We did beginning of the year assessments and we did the middle of the year assessments, but we never came back around and did the end of the year. So this is a, a different comparison. And so again, just kind of helps us position for what intervention needs that we have. And so I didn't want to have a superintendent update and not review all the data that we're looking at. But again, that just situates us um, as part of that district improvement planning process. And so we have targeted areas of focus at the district level but that the campus is looking at as well moving forward with their with district improvement plans and campus improvement plans and you know we shared this graphic with y'all a couple months ago just to help frame the fact that the profile of a learner anchors all of our our vision work right we move next into the accountability piece which is our CBAS our seven pillars um, for community-based accountability there are key questions that help us target our improvement efforts around those different pillars and that's that third column there's a strategic lens that's laid over top of that but those four goal areas um, we have our areas of, of focus for district improvement plan and our campuses will work on that and we'll present that um, in July. That is always part of the um, learning walks that we take you on. We have them kind of highlight what their areas of, of focus are academic in, in each one of those pillar areas that kind of frames uh, those work and the accountability piece for that. So, um, so we have work to do, we are, we are rolling up our sleeves. We have a leadership summit that takes place at the very end of July where we um, share out the work that's taking place for the campus and, and the goal areas moving forward. Um, just some continued updates. We are engaged in, in working through some drafts of our ESSER three fund plans. Um, you all know that we had to post um, the opportunity for public comment on our website we've done that we have gotten some feedback back on that just what areas of prioritization our community would like us to consider um, we did spend some time with our district education advisory council um, a subgroup who meets about federal funds and and they met to provide some funding and so we've got a draft plan in place and, and um, shared you know one iteration with you all but the plan is a four-year plan so it's how we're going to use this money from 2020 to 2024 understanding that that money goes away after 2024 so whatever we you know put into place is not necessarily something that's going to be sustainable and so um, there is a priority in our plan uh, to reimburse expenses for us to open our doors this past year and so there will be a chunk of that money that that off the top goes to reimbursement um, academic intervention summer academic programs student wellness um, so my plan at this point is to have that plan ready for presentation to you all at our August meeting. So continue to work through that. Um, summer school is up and running. We're at week two. I am celebrating high attendance at our summer school. I had a superintendent meeting this morning and we all compared notes about um, how well summer school is being attended everywhere. And I'm gonna tell you, I mean, we're, in, we're in the 90% um, at all levels. Our credit recovery at the high school is not as high um, it's about 70% right now, but still, when I heard the comparison of where other people are getting kids re-engaged in schools, I'm celebrating. So we have 175 students who are in our early Spanish literacy, grades K1 and 2. You all know that we went to continuous learning. Our language program students were at a disadvantage because they didn't have the exposure to Spanish language throughout the day. And so we knew, we anticipated that that was going to be a big area of focus. And so we invited all of them to Spanish literacy summer school. We have 160 students in, in remediation and enrichment in our pre-K through five, and you all remember that we are um, only required to offer the bilingual summer school, but we always have offered the pre-K through five. And so it is going to be nice to offset some of that with the ESSER funds, because we, again, we're including more kids. We have 100 students um, who are at the junior school for credit recovery and remediation, 50 at the high school for credit recovery, 49 um, in end of course preparations, and we have 270 students who are taking, um, what we call it acceleration, but they're getting high school credit you know, during the summer. So we have a lot going on summer school-wise. Um, we are all teeing up, I mean, right now, rolling up our sleeves, 
into just the planning for next year. You all know that this is the big hiring time for us. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about personnel tonight, that we've got some great hires coming on board. Um, but our principals are pretty consumed with that right now just because of that July deadline for resignations. We're working hard to get people in place. Um, we have a big commitment around um, professional development for our teachers. Um, I shared, um, Carly's the only one in the audience here, but I shared with our trustees all of the, the um, PD that we stand up as a district, our teacher leaders stand up, our administrators stand up, and we've got lots of participation in that. But I thought it would be interesting for me to share with you some of the requirements that the state um, dictates for our teachers. There's over seven hours of required training that our teachers have to go through in the summer. We, well, and they don't have to do it in the summer. They have to do it on their own time. So they could do it on a weekend. Um, they could do it after contract time. But we've, uh, Frank Stanich has worked to stand up an online platform where they're taking classes like bloodborne pathogens, bullying, common illness prevention, conflict management, student to student, cyberbullying, cybersecurity training, health emergency, seizures, human trafficking, um, Title IX compliance, youth suicide, trauma-informed approach, part one and part two, and our Alamo Heights ISD employee handbook. So I just think it's important that you all know how much our teachers do in the summer as far as their professional development efforts. All right, um, we also are continuing to work through um, registrations on all of our campuses, um, class placements, um, schedules at our junior school and our high school and we did come to you all last week and share just that targeted communication plan that that we're trying to stand up once the schedule planning is done um, and once back to school fine-tuned details are done we are planning on a, a three-week communication um, blitz what I'm calling it um, where we come from the district side and we have some videos that are going out and we offer um, campus coffee chats with principals to kind of follow up on what that translates into on the campuses and so we're planning on that that very last week of July and then into August those next two weeks um, and our principals will host an update at our next board meeting about the finalized plans around the block schedule for you as well so now we get into legislative update and there's a lot here and so what I share with you as far as at this point you know the, the session has closed and there's a ton of bills that have been Promoted, and there are some that have not. So I'm going to try to just highlight those that are on my radar um, for, that will have implications for us in the district. Um, it goes to the governor, right? And then after that, it goes to TA for some regulations and, and some implementation. And then it goes to TASB, and TASB then turns it to us for recommended policy. So we've got a ways to go as far as the timeline for all of this. But um, at some point, aren't we supposed to get a training on it? Isn't there a required training for us? There is a required legislative, yeah. So there's, we can, you know, do, let you do that online. You can do it through Summer Leadership Institute. We could do it at TASB next year. You've got a ways Plenty to go before you okay. can get, yeah. So just some of the um, bills that were passed that are on my radar. Um, the first of which is the House Bill 3 cleanup bill. And um, it guarantees the funding of House Bill 3. And so that's good news. Um, for us, it does restore the gifted and talented allotment that was taken away. It's, it's a decreased allotment than what it had always been, but it does reinst reinstate that. Um, it also allows um, for adjustments to dyslexia grants and trainings. It modifies the CTE allotment for small and mid-sized districts, which is good for us. And it does um, promote a higher weight for a higher level of CTE courses, and so you know that we've been working hard to kind of grow and align our pathways through CTE to allow those higher level courses and, and we would get funding for that. Um, and the big celebration is that it does allow the tuition allotment to continue. And so I, I, it's all limited. I'm sorry. They didn't limit it. At one point you were afraid they were going to. Yeah. So it, it, we had great conversations about it on the house side when it went to the Senate side. Um, I wasn't being, uh, it, we were not gaining any traction as far as conversation around that. Um, Stacy and Carrie both engaged um, with Senator Campbell around it, um, and I actually got some, some good conversation time with her, I think, as a result of that, and um, celebration all around on that. So, um, The next one is the House Bill 4545, which is the accountability bill. And so this just, um, for us, it does not require us um, 
it, it, I'm sorry, if a student does not pass an assessment in grade three through eight, they're entitled to a, um, a, a, a committee meeting um, and a certain level of teacher designation. And so they're entitled to a teacher and a teacher incentive allotment, um, or they're able to choose their teacher that they would want to have. So they're able to have choice in this. We'll see how that all pans out. Teacher's able to say, well, I think this teacher would be better. Um, say that yeah. yeah, so if a student does not pass assessment in grades three through eight, they're entitled to a teacher who's at a, the teacher incentive allotment as a recommended teacher, or they're allowed to choose the teacher that they'd like to be in their class. The child gets to choose the teacher. Well, the parent, yeah. Okay. They may be doing it, but that was surprising. That it, yeah. Um, yeah, how's that going to work? Yeah, how's that going to work? We're going to wait to see how that What if everyone down the picks the same side. teacher? I'm the right. other thing in here, which is a celebration, is that they're – there was no bonuses added to star achievement for schools. You know, that was something that, that yeah. we spoke out about against um, statewide as being detrimental to the whole process. Um, in curriculum and instruction, um, highlighted here is that House Bill 3979, the anti-critical race theory um, bill. And so there's gonna be a lot of, of details that come down the pike um, from that, but it does say that they're requiring um, some additional details in the TEKS um, related to certain subjects. It does say that teachers will not be compelled to discuss current events, and if they do, they should present multiple points of view without giving difference to any one perspective. And employees can opt out of trainings that are connected to racial, um, sexual superiority, which is not critical race theory. We'll see how that all. Sorry. Racial sexual superiority. Uh -huh. Those are the words in here from Bear, well, Bear County Education Coalition. <laughs> well, and Dan, while you're covering that, if yeah. anyone is still listening, I mean, having reviewed our policy on, you know, we have policies about dealing with controversial topics in the classroom, and, and you can remind us of the exact language, but Alma Heights already had a policy in place that if you're covering a controversial topic, you are required to share both sides and invite conversation on both sides. So just, that you know, that, you know that's, we're going to be dealing with that specific bill, but in our district, we had a pretty, you know, a pretty clear policy in place on how to handle topics like that. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. And are we doing some special professional development on teaching and handling? Well, it, that, the, the training is all around the policy. Training, right? yeah, Just to kind of refresh on. folks what. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we're ahead of the legislature. Oh, of course. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Well, I'm just asking, is it, a, is it a he says, she says? Well, so Dana can answer it more specifically, but for what, what Ryan's referring to is that's exactly what they're working on is, is sort of the training. The policy exists, and there has been training in the past, but trying to kind of re-up or tweak the yeah. training to work with the teachers on how to follow the policy, because it's definitely not clear for any human being that deals with a controversial topic how you do that well, right? And so I think you all are working on that, right? right? So it's kind of twofold as far as the accountability piece. You know, it requires a parent coming forward and letting us know if there's something that's being covered in the class that they feel like is outside that lane so an administrator can follow up on it. And it also requires our administrators to be present in the classroom, right, and present for planning conversations um, when curriculum departments meet. So, um, but yes, we did that for everyone on that um, April 24th. Uh, professional Development Day. And so um, two other areas of focus under curriculum and instruction um, is the House Bill 1468, which does not allow us to offer remote option. We knew that already. And I will tell you there's conversation that in the special session, they might revisit that. Um, we had two students, two families, who said that they would like to have that um, option provided to them and say so we're going to work through some accommodations through 504 because of their health considerations. And then finally, this is a big one that I went on your radar because you're going to hear talk about it, but it's House Bill 547, which allows UIL, I'm sorry, U, yes, UIL participation for homeschool students. That passed? It passed, but it gives us the discretion of allowing it or not allowing it. And so um, I will tell you the conversation with the superintendents all around the board this morning was that not one district in our Bear County is going to do that. And so that's nice to have that, you know, to that home approach. schooler is seven foot three and can pick the three. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do I have up there I'm just crossing the microphone. I can't see your <laughs> <laughs> well, and didn't didn't we already? Uh, 
I don't know if it was a formal policy, but didn't we already uh, announce publicly and agree that our position on homeschool, to the extent we had it, was that they, they were not going to be participating in UIL? I mean, that's what Jimmy shared in her presentation. So you're talking about heights at home. We, were, we, we said that any of our heights at home oh, students. Oh, this is homeschool. This is homeschool. Yeah, but we don't even straight get any money. Yeah, right. Your kids up. are at the house right. and you're teaching. Yeah. But yet your kids can still have the community was, with sports. And, and well, you're the one. My mind, I was thinking the heights parent okay. is given the grade. Too, right there's grade eligibility right for participation oh, yeah. in the oh, and so the parents given the grade parents determining eligibility oh gosh and so what a nightmare this right this on. took some oh, some I don't know, <laughs> got some traction so it is interesting just to look at what did not pass because a lot of this is celebration and so the I came to you frustrated about the S or three restrictions um, as far as needing to reserve some of it for fund balance um, that did not pass the virtual instruction I explained that uh, transgender sports participation restrictions, you know, got a lot of traction, a lot of talk, and um, that did not pass. Fun balance restrictions, I was, I came to you frustrated about that at one point, asked you to engage. Um, Assessment-based funding, reduction in required assessments, there was a big push to reduce the number of state assessments, and that did not pass. Vouchers, and, and a celebration is this taxpayer-funded lobby uh, limitation, because as you all know, we partner very closely with Christy Realm. Yeah. Texas School Coalition. Um, she was very instrumental in getting us the audience that we needed to get with Senator Campbell. Um, also, Bear County Education Coalition, Julia Grizzard works for us as well. And so, um, TASA works on our behalf, on behalf of all public schools. And so, there was a lot of worry that that was going to pass. Thanks. So just some celebrations to highlight for you all. Um, since May, we had a great celebration yesterday that our the class of 2020's rocket was cleared for launch. So we had students who are in college right now came back to unveil their um, rocket yesterday. And it was a, or not yesterday, it was on Monday. Um, and that's a huge celebration. Um, two of our campuses earned a, a National Promising Practices Award from character.org, Cambridge and the high school for um, couple different initiatives that are taking place there. Our Spurs dance team um, earned awards at their, um, their officer camp. They earned most spirited, the team of the day, and the most disciplined team. Um, we had 15 participants, actually I'm wrong, I think we had 12 participants at the Martha Spore Writer Workshop that was held this past week, and that's always a celebration. I partner with the foundation on that and get to celebrate on Friday evening their work from the week. Um, and then a last celebration, y'all, we have 308 athletes at the high school enrolled and participate in MIT, and we have 156 at the junior school. So we got a lot going on. They're like, feels good. Kind of feels back to normal in a real way. So. And that's everybody's smiling. It's so great. That's right. I just see their smiles again. Can I ask two questions? Yes. Can we have some people? So one of the speakers tonight brought us the AP report, and I believe Dr. Walker is going to dive into that point. There seems to be an implication that the ranking was due more to a lack of focus on education, on, on social and emotional. As she completed her review of kind of the, remember the deeper dive, what really getting statistics about how that report or how they did their statistics. And on initial glance, mm -hmm. it's based on um, uh, low end of course percented passing. Right. Okay. Uh, can you? I don't. I don't know what you're talking about, Brian. Yeah. Can you say the US, the US US yeah. yeah. Report, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. So we are in the top 10 percent of AP yeah. scores, oh. and we're in the bottom 10 percent of end of course percent passage. So that's kind of the, the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, the we'll gap. have her talk to you when she does. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm brought that a lot. I would love to have a good answer. Yeah. I don't know the answer. I thought there was also something about the AP scores. Our AP scores are really good, but our end of course scores are not good. And the way U.S. News and the end of course scores count thirty yeah. percent of the time. And then wasn't it also like socioeconomically disadvantaged? There was a. There may have been Brian. Let, let me have her do a little bit more digging about that. That'd be great. Just to. Yeah. Because there's more to it than just. Yeah, but it it's also a big area of improvement that we need to figure out. You know, right, so and not, so like, tap dancing, yeah. yeah. <coughs> and then the ESSER, sorry, the ESSER input from the parents, how's that, and sorry, I don't know, but how's that work? Like, how broadly are we asking for their input? Is it like, hey, how do you want us to spend this $5 million? Yeah, or, it's pretty much broad, like that, yes. And we have had um, 
over 100 responses in there that Jimmy's kind of tracking, and you know, she'll thematically look at that and um, come up with some, yeah, she'll, she'll spend some time in there, so. I was only jumping in to say that whenever Jimmy shares with us about that, I know she has some in the past, but um, if she could give us the historical look because uh, someone was saying that we had dropped, and I didn't, I don't know, I just would yeah. like to see that. Or sure. Are we dropping, or is it just that we've always been at that rate? Or is it a recalculation? Or, you know, right. Are the statistics the same? Are the grading criteria the same? Right. I think their weighting had changed of the various things, but yeah, Jimmy. I mean, a Google search didn't answer the question for me, so right. if Jimmy has better access than yeah. I do, I would appreciate it. I thought there was something about our eighth graders taking AP algebra and that not getting calculated in or something. Yeah, about but that. I, when I look at that, I think that's interesting. So that happens at Eanes too, and Eanes isn't at the same place we are, you know? So I, I don't know that that's worth hanging our hat on, but it's worth, I'll have her yeah, dig a little bit more on it. Yep. Yeah. Well, and um, since you also mentioned, Dana, the master schedule and, and the principals working on that, and since we obviously had some comments on that today too, um, you know, I, I know you guys are, I, I know you, you guys are you know, speaking to these parents, I've spoken to some of them, but you know, they raised some really good specific data points, especially about the missed class time in those last yeah, periods. And was, so, um, you know, so since you brought up the topic, I know that y'all can go back to this and, and maybe reanalyze it as needed. And if there needs to be some shuffling done, um, you know, it, it does so raise the sure. question whether one team needs to bear that for I mean, Maybe the football team should be second and sixth, and you know, the volleyball teams don't need to travel, you know, have to travel farther, or, you know, which teams can better do that, or can they all be together, so I'm not going to... Why can't we all just be at the end of the day? I mean, why can't all athletics be at the end of the day, like, I know... Like, because of the facility use, the gym sharing, like, if it rains outside, you have to pull, you have to stagger that athletic period, so, um, but I will, I'll, I mean, we are definitely listening and making tweaks on that, it's interesting, because... You know, there weren't decisions necessarily that have been made to this point that we've been able to communicate out, which is frustrating, you know, yeah. but, but it, this takes every year when you do a straight eight, it takes yeah. us until mid-July to get the right. schedule set, so. Uh, it's hard when people are jumping to conclusions when we're still in the process, but yeah. we did that all summer. So. Right. Yeah. Well, some, some of those parents started with one understanding, but they have spoken to us or to the administration, and now they have a better understanding. I think what they were saying wasn't inaccurate. It's just that, you know, there it's... It's a it's a hard thing to figure out the logistics and the principals I know are working on that. Um, well, and I'm there's the question of, you know, whether we want you know we are losing some academic time in exchange for extra athletic time every week, and so is that the exchange we want to make right now? And is that you know so there's and, there's and things that it seems like we're making progress on the conversation. And, and I'm hopeful that we can address all this in committee because I feel like we're kind of winding off. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Very valid concerns, whole lot we got to talk about, but just stick to where we are. That was probably my role. That's Thank good. You. Uh, <laughs> modeling. Time management. Uh, Mike Dell, you're in the last seat. That's right. Well, yeah, I, I agree. So we don't need to get the lids. But, but we were talking about the teachers on the slides and what they're doing in the summer. And so my only concern or question would have been. Uh, because I think you mentioned seven hours of training for blood for pathogens and blah, blah, blah. At what point are they going to get a real good refresher course about the block schedule and how to teach to it? Is it going to be on the fly after we start school, or is there a set-aside time to do that? Yeah, so some do it naturally better than others already. We know that. Um, yes. There are some that need um, summer attention and, and have had conversations with. Um, so all of the professional development that takes place in the summer is through a goal setting process at the end of their year evaluation. And so those that need to walk through that are walking through that this summer, but there will also be a, a reset for everybody when we get back in August as well. We have a whole week ahead of time, so. Uh, but they know this is coming and you know they, they're planning and prepping for it. So it's a good question. Thanks, Dan. All right, before we move into our next items, if there are no objections, we will take a short break before entering into executive session as per Texas Government Code, section 551.001.